So if you're on the list, you get 10 minutes. And after that, we'll, we'll see what you get. Um, Pavel, take it away. Thank you. Do something cool. I do only cool. <laughs> OK. So uh, the project I've been working on for some time now uh, is uh, hierarchical limits for ZFS. So the idea is that uh, you would like to uh, limit the resources that are used by the given data sets or a set of data sets. So let's say uh, you have a layout like this and you have some jails and you would like each jail not to consume more bandwidth than X or not to consume more uh, like metadata operations than X. So if you have a bunch of jails, uh, one of them cannot starve uh, the entire pool and the rest will be just fighting for the scraps that's, that are left. So uh, the way you can configure that uh, uh, is by few, sorry, few new uh, properties where you can uh, configure read bandwidth, write bandwidth, or total, which is uh, uh, which you combine read and write. And op is basically metadata operations, so stuff like creating a file, renaming a file, unlinking a file, uh, creating hard link, symlink, uh, stuff like this. Also, read write operations are also counted as operations. Uh, but the way we, uh, we do that is that we take the request and we, uh, we, and we uh, see how many blocks are in this request. So th this will be that many operations will be accounted for. Uh, so uh, bandwidth also uh, limits uh, ZFS send and receive. Uh, but uh, one important thing to know is that this is done very close to VFS. So it's not at the disk level. So it may totally, uh, you may totally see something else on the disks than you see in the limits. And uh, the reason why is that it's extremely hard in ZFS to do this accounting properly uh, at a very low level or it's impossible. Uh, because of um, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on, so let's say uh, so um, the reason I did it this way is to make it predictable. So you can monitor your data sets currently and see how much bandwidth they require and put your limits somewhere uh, in there. If you would put them on the disks. Let's say uh, you put some limits on the uh, close to the disks, and because of compression, it doesn't match what you configured, or because of inflation caused by RAID Z or RAID Z2, or uh, you're using uh, multiple copies of the data uh, with copy property and stuff like that. So it would be totally unpredictable how to figure out what the li what what limits are are good. So, uh, so this is implement, and also ZFS delays some stuff like when you write, you actually just add data to transaction group, which will be sync in a few seconds. So we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, precisely do the accounting at this level. So uh, the way it works, let's say, uh, let me remit, uh, limit bandwidth for, um, to 100 megabytes for this data set. Uh, well, let's say maybe 300. So now when I use, uh, when I use, uh, uh, when I write, uh, read from, from a file in any of the file systems below, below that, I should get something around 
uh, this 300 megabytes. So let's try to read four gigs, maybe too much. Uh, let's try something. But yes, we got something close to 300 megabytes. So I can limit this further uh, on for each jail. So let's say let's set 50 megabytes here, 75, and 100. Uh, and then I will try to run a few DD processes and hopefully you will be able to see the limits working. Um, let's say 300 megabytes. Uh, okay, so one we have around 100 megabytes, 75 and, and 50. Uh, and of course, if you put uh, higher limits than the uh, than your parents, then you won't be able to. It works pretty much at, uh, as quota. So you can set quota on the parent, and you can set even higher quotas on the children. But still, the quota on the parent will be enforced. So this works exactly the same. And uh, I was trying hard uh, not to introduce. Uh, uh, not to introduce any penalties if you don't uh, use the limits. So let's say, uh, let's read four gigabytes if there are no limits. This is pretty much sparse file. So it's around uh, one gigabyte per second. So if I uh, configure some really high limits, uh, there will be accounted. Uh, so the account it will work, but it shouldn't impact uh, performance uh, pretty much. So uh, yeah, so that was the idea. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, NFS. TC. Uh, TCSH? I can understand That was, uh, I was wondering actually if people will ask me about apply or about the DD that shows human readable numbers. <laughs> uh, yeah? Uh, it is not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the problem is that uh, to apply percentage, we would need to uh, have like an accounting, uh, like constantly uh, measure how much bandwidth do we have. And this is really, especially in ZFS, you, it can be really imprecise, right? Because one data set will have compression on, the other will have not, or will have like copies configured, or uh, or you have some database and uh, ZFS has, has this uh, NOP write, NOP write functionality where you actually write but you don't write anything. And also with block cloning, we charge as you would do writing, uh, but actually we just clone blocks and it's, it doesn't really occupy the disk bandwidth. Uh, so yeah, but I didn't want to do anything in the middle also because then it would be impossible to, to figure out if the actual limits are obeyed or not. But this way you can, uh, you can gather statistics from your data sets and see how much bandwidth they require, they, they, they are using and just set up limits uh, to match those needs, I guess. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. There's a green light? Yeah, cool.
So again, I'm Pierre Pochery, uh, I'm Corbin. I have many hats, even if right now I wear only one. I'm with the NetBSD Foundation as a developer since 2012. FreeBSD Foundation now for slightly over a year. And the D4iOS project, uh, if you're familiar with that. But today, even though I'm using a Mac, sorry, uh, I'm gonna show you how to install FreeBSD with style uh, using two different virtual machines. So right now I have VirtualBox. The first one is my uh, work environment development system um, using WindowMaker, of course. And then I'm going to start a virtual machine with a, a disk that is meant to look like it's new. So just supposedly full of zeros. And I'm going to boot off of the network. This is actually meant to simulate um, a uh, read-only installation media like a CD-ROM, I hope this is not too small, if, or maybe I can have an intermediate zoom. So I'm booting off of PXE from this other virtual machine right now. Usually it's not that slow, it's a bit slow, but not that bad, I don't know what's going on. Maybe I can start again. So. It should serve the PXE loader on TFTP. Yes, over there, all right. Now we are inside a FreeBSD bootloader. And again, this is rather slow. So basically, a few months ago, I offered uh, the foundation to look at the, um, the installer, but um, to create a graphical version of the installer, the FreeBSD installer. First, I compared what existed um, in other open source projects like Midnight BSD, PC BSD, um, and so on. And I've been also told, uh, please write the whole thing again from scratch because uh, it's not good. But as tempting as it was, I figured I could um, achieve this without rewriting the text-based installer, rewriting the current one, but instead extending it in a way that we could use it graphically and then um, both sides can improve each other. If I improve the text-based one, it improves the graphical one and the other way around. And right now there is really a big problem because this is supposed to take literally half a second. It worked just before and now not anymore. Demo effect again. Don't know what's up, just gonna try again. Okay. Oh, it looks just as bad. Maybe I can find a backup presentation. So I, I showed this work at Asia BSDCon. And which system did I use? Was it? I think I did it with Keynote. Which also should be faster. <laughs> I've published videos on YouTube also, which are not really uh, public, but uh, my presentation is, and links to it. Uh, it's probably not here. Must be that.
it was the right one. Okay, it, I have probably a version from Keynote. Okay, let's just play it. So we're going to pretend we run VirtualBox for real. So it's a, we're stuck here right now, but thankfully uh, we can boot the graphic installer as you can see. Uh, I'm pressing enter. Yeah, it works, obviously. So we are booting off of NFS now uh, from the, the pixel loader. So the kernel is booting super fast. It's almost like calling fast right now. Okay, we go straight into the, um, the text mode because this works actually um, as a fallback. If the graphical installer doesn't work, it will just not start and then you have this anyway. Uh, this is just straight from the memstick um, release scripts. And there we go, we have now xorg uh, with the graphical prompt, which will look exactly like uh, the text mode, except we're obviously using GTK right now uh, with a bigger font size than uh, usual for the purposes of the demo, so that's why, it's, unfortunately, there's a bug with this window, but we can just continue with the default key map, uh, choose a host name, we move on, we choose the system component we want to install, continue, probe the devices, it's going also super fast, look, okay, it's gone. <laughs> Lightning talk, right? Then this is the least user-friendly part of the whole installer, so for the purposes of the graphical installer, I kind of skip the choice of UFS versus ZFS, because the UFS partitioning is written in C using cursors, and I cannot easily just convert that automatically to the graphical installer. But ZFS is using um, dialog or busy dialog through BSD config, so this works right out, the, right out of the box. And we choose Stripe, which is like the not so obvious part for beginners. And then we choose our virtual box, virtual uh, hard drive, get back here, Stripe one disk, we proceed. Yes, we are absolutely sure this is our last chance to uh, have a graphical installer, please, please merge it. And then one thing that I had to make a bit more ugly into the graphical one compared to the text base is uh, this step, the checksum and installation. Basically because again, this was implemented in uh, C with cursors. Um, it's also possible to use basic dialog. It's just not as uh, convenient, but then you can go one by one. The progress bar is not super fancy. Uh, this could be solved with DPV which might be asked by Baptiste at some point, but maybe I can uh, ask him to keep it for a bit longer, if this can be a good use case. Then we choose the root password. We will skip configuring IPv4 and IPv6 because we're in a PDF anyway. Then we jump in the past, but don't worry, this is still June 1st. Can you believe this is June 1st? Um, hi, Jimmy. And we set the time. We choose um, specific configuration uh, as usual, as you know from the text installer. We will add a user account for myself. So this is me, and I'm sorry, I'm a bit selfish. So after setting my password, I will not add another user. But if you ask politely, maybe I can create an account for you. And then uh, final step, except for starting a shell, which also works, it spawns a uh, Xterm uh, with the console show rooted as you are used to into the final system. And then installation is complete. So it's time to reboot into our real um, system. Then as VirtualBox reboots, this is also super fast. And I pressed F12 to not boot online by default, but specifically the hard drive that we just uh, totally installed for real. And instead of saying boot graphical installer, it now says boot multi-user, which is what you would see and expect, then we create our SSH keys. This is again calling fast and we can already log in. And we do that. Um, I type my password like uh, lightning fast also. And then as you can see, we are even allowed to become root. And here we are uh, installing a 14.0 release with style graphical installer in just a couple minutes. Yeah, totally for real. Then if you have any questions, happy to um, answer that now. I don't know how much time I have with the mishaps at the beginning. OK, you have to be lightning fast. Oh, yes, we have one. What language is it written in? What language is it written in? So the installer from GVSD is written mostly in shell. 
uh, and then the original busy dialog is written in C. And I re-implemented that with GTK in C as well. So it's just a drop-in replacement for whatever does the display, a bit of glue with, the, uh, with XORG, and that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be in the corridor. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about NetGraph, which is a technology that I feel like uh, doesn't get a lot of love in FreeBSD. Um, and I use a script that I wrote, an RC script called uh, NetGraph Buddy, uh, to help make it easy to use uh, uh, both Jail and Beehive at the same time. I couldn't find any uh, NetGraph projects that let you do both really easily together. Um, so this is my first BSD can, so here's just a quick intro about me. I've been using FreeBSD for 26 years, but I'm a deadbeat, so this is my first BSD can. Um, and uh, the reason why you might want to use NetGraph instead of the typical ways to connect your guests um, uh, to your host is uh, I find it just a little bit calmer because if you use IF, um, IF bridge, that creates, a, that creates a, a device. And then you have tap devices for all your, uh, your, all your Beehive VMs. And then you have a, a pair, two ePair devices for all of your jails. So it just gets a little busy when you start getting into the teens and 20s and so on. Um, there also might be some performance uh, benefits to using uh, NetGraph versus the, the common ways that we usually set up our FreeBSD guests. Um, and there's also some really great built-in graphing and metrics. Um, if you're not using NetGraph, there's a lot more documentation. Now, NetGraph is actually fairly well documented, but there's a lot of different pieces, and it's super flexible, so it's sometimes hard to figure out where to look for the right documentation. So uh, thankfully, we're on the big screen. So now, as you see on the left, it's a little bit messy to get started. So uh, to get started with uh, NetGraph, uh, hopefully somebody will come, come around and write something better than NetGraph Buddy. But in the meantime, I have a couple of RC scripts. You just say service ng up enable and start, and you get um, a pair of devices. And, and what I was trying to do is try to do something sort of like uh, VMware and VirtualBox does, where there's sort of a NAT mode, and then there's a bridge mode. So you can put some of your guests on a virtual network that's hidden and NATed uh, to, your, to your network, and one that, that's uh, quote unquote directly on the network, so bridge directly onto your network. Um, so, and just like all of our other FreeBSD um, guests, we'll need to set up our, our network. Now, um, a lot of the tools that are out there will automatically remember to turn off uh, LRO, which is a feature um, to, uh, to enhance network performance on your uh, network interface. Um, that will, you'll need to remember to turn that off yourself. So VM Beehive is a really great um, uh, uh, virtual machine manager for, uh, for, for Beehive. And it's version 1.5, which I think came out last year, maybe a little bit, a little bit longer, supports NetGraph. It, it's built in. All you have to do is create a, a, a switch of the type NetGraph in the configuration file in VM Beehive. And it's, it's working. All you need is that uh, ng bridge device, and your VMs will immediately work. Um, for jails, you need a device called an, um, as opposed to the ePair, um, the device you'll use is called an, um, uh, an ng ei face device. So you'll have to create those. Again, this is a little bit tricky. So some scaffolding and uh, some, some scripts to to keep track of your link numbers and stuff like that can, can really help, because it is a little bit more complicated to use than, um, than ePair. And then you just configure your guests as usual. Now, if you go on any NetGraph page, the, it uses a uh, SVG uh, dot format, and it can actually map out, make a beautiful map of all of the devices in your, in your um, in your FreeBSD host system, which is really helpful. You get a, you know, you automatically get graphing. Now I have a little uh, script that actually assigns my, this is sanitized, these aren't, 
these aren't real, but uh, but here it's a, it's a this is a, a JavaScript format that that can embed into all sorts of different uh, documentation systems. And I actually have all of my hosts feeding my documentation system uh, um, the a host diagram of all of the uh, the the public. That's a real physical interface and. Then private, which is our um, which is our private interface, and what's connected to it, and uses different symbols for VMs and jails, and so on, things that are on off, um, etc. And then it uh, also has some built-in statistics. Now NetGraph is incredibly flexible. Um, I'm just really scratching the surface. I just find it to be a you know calmer and uh, and simpler way to manage all of these things together, um, and uh, and that's it. So some resources if you want to give this a try. I really think that NetGraph is a great way to manage your, um, uh, to manage your network for, for all of your guests on one machine. Uh, most of the managers don't have a unified uh, way to do that. So, so I think this is worth looking into. And if you're a developer that's interested in networking, I think NetGraph could probably use some, uh, some love these days. Some great resources. Uh, you can look at my dumb script. Uh, it's an RC script, and then there's uh, you know a little stat viewer and, and stuff like that uh, that can help you get started. Um, in user share examples, there's some jail scripts, and this this will create the NetGraph devices and even bridges that you need. And you just pop that little script inside uh, your jail conf, and that'll that'll also be a great way to get you started. Uh, Clara Systems has a great article that was uh, some inspiration for uh, the work, uh, some of the work that I did here. And if you want to argue with me and others, um, you should come on the uh, call for testing. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. UTC. Um, every week we have a call about jails and, and talk about uh, uh, different things we can do to push performance and features to, to the max. And, uh, and that's it. I tried to keep it short. Any questions? Yes. What about a a port? Oh no no no! It's it's I, it's not quite refined. By by the way, I do use. So the question was, do I have a do I have a port in the FreeBSD ports collection for NetGraph Buddy? I don't, but um, I have used it with with many hundreds of instances so far. It's just. Uh, Probably needs a little bit of cleaning and a man page, and, and it should be ready to go. Uh, I will uh, talk to the yeah. I, I'll, I'll I'll get that done. Oh, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Just one. Sure. Takes the networking layer from Unix and hides it. Um, so now I can't touch it, see it, look at it with any of the traditional tools that I would use. Is this causing you any problems? OK, so the question is um, because NetGraph hides the devices, is, 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 that, a, is that a problem for me? Um, so I would I would say no because I'm using those NGEI face devices for the for the jails. So I can see the device. You're right. I can't see those devices uh, if they're buried in VNet, but I can't see those devices if they're buried in VNet anyway. I can see the other wire connecting to my IF um, bridge bridge device, but I think that that has uh, has somewhat uh, limited utility now. We're on FreeBSD, so everybody gets to do it <laughs> our, our own way. And I think that I think that IF Bridge is still going to be a, a good solution for um, for for a lot of for a lot of people. I think that I think that this way is a little bit calmer for um, you know setups with large numbers of uh, large numbers of hosts when you when when you don't mind that that's that that's happening. That NGCTL is the is the uh, command to 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 um, to see this, to see what's going on uh, deeper in the stack? But that that's a great that's a great point, and I think that everybody should understand that that you know you're, that that when you create a Beehive interface, you see that tap device. If you're using the traditional way, if you're using NetGraph, 
it uses a neck graft socket uh, device, which is hidden. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point. All right, anybody else? All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>